Well, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here to uh, talk about something that's very dear to my heart and I've been working on actually for about 20 years, which is this topic of harmonized recommendations. Um, so um, I do not have any conflicts of interest that could affect my presentation here. So I really want to focus on this publication that came out in November of last year, uh, which is a publication in which myself, Alicia Karakiri, who's an eminent statistician at Iowa State University, and Suzanne Murphy, who's known to many of you for working on um, food intake recommendations, requirements, and so on, we put together a proposed set of harmonized nutrient reference values for populations. And we started doing this in about 2002 because we needed these values. We needed them for a software program that Alicia had developed at Iowa State uh, that she was using to evaluate, uh, she's used it to assess uh, prevalence of inadequate intakes in the Philippines and in Mexico. And in particular, what I was working on at the time is the recommendations for adding new micronutrients uh, to 40, for 45 foods uh, in a document for WHO. And so we needed these, um, these values right away. They're being used right now, but we, what I'm going to talk about is a recently updated set of values. So as Sue pointed out, we need two core values for population assessment, the average requirement and the upper level. We do not need the RDAs to assess um, dietary guide, to make dietary guidelines or assess population prevalences of inadequacy or e excess. So the purpose of this paper was to harmonize the ARs and the ULs, average requirements and upper levels, for as many nutrients as possible, because as Sue pointed out, they don't all exist in current data sets. So Sue um, justified establishing these values, and I'm going to add a few other points as well. I totally agree with her reasons. So we, we are calling, and this is personal, right? This is not IOM, it's anything else. It's, this is a, a, a group of three suggesting this process. So these are going to be called harmonized nutrition reference values. So one main point is that all recommendations are somewhat uncertain. Most of the studies we're depending on are relatively few people. Sometimes um, uh, there could be genetic factors which nobody assessed. There could be um, uh, methods which are outdated, whatever. And also individual requirements are variable. So this is not a perfect science. There's no point in my mind about quibbling about 50 milligrams here or there. In the end, it really doesn't matter that much. The current tables that we're going to show, um, the data sets have many missing values, especially ARs and um, also adequate intakes. Um, it's unlikely, it seems to us, that the current gaps are gonna be rapidly filled by more science. It's extremely expensive. The gaps that exist are because they are difficult to uh, determine. There are either missing biomarkers or there are a lot of missing data for infants and children because the, the methods would be invasive um, and so on. So, um, and honestly, uh, at least I can say in more developed countries, developed higher income countries, there's not a lot of interest in spending funds, research funds, on improving the recommendations. And then another point that's been made is after correction for bioavailability, iron, copper as examples, it's really unlikely actual requirements vary much across population groups. Another example might be folate in populations such as Mexico, for example, where there's um, a high prevalence of the MTHFR genotype, but we don't have those data for many populations yet. 
An important point, just because a country has a high prevalence of deficiency, or let me say deficiency, inadequate values, intake values, either of those, doesn't mean to say that the requirements should be higher. It's just, not the, it's just that the recurrent recommendations are not being met. So if a country sets their recommendations higher, it doesn't do anything because the recommendations are still not being met. And that's something a lot of people uh, take a while to understand. Um, so the published values do differ somewhat across countries and agencies, as Sue pointed out. But now with the um, onset of systematic reviews and clear justifications, which has been used through the um, uh, Institute of Medicine process and in EFSA, uh, we know why each value was selected. So we can explain differences between data sets and um, accept or reject those, um, choose between them, whatever. The cost of redoing, or say redoing, or doing systematic reviews is prohibitive. Um, there's been an estimate of about a million dollars per nutrient to do this properly if you're starting from scratch. We should use and update existing values or existing systematic reviews, and we do need more. And lastly, programs and evaluations are going on, and we already need harmonized nutrient reference values. Um, if things are being compared across the world in terms of adequacy or inta of intake, fortification requirements, labeling or whatever, we already need those, and they're already, um, people are um, suggesting them. So there are two uh, main data sets that we depended on. One is the di dietary reference intakes of what was then the, the IOM. Um, and that is, as you know, a large set of books on specific nutrients uh, sort of summarized in this particular volume. And the other set is EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, who took eight years to come up with this summary report uh, with their recommendations. Both of them use the model that is being recommended now by the National Academy and, in fact, has been used by groups like for the fortification report of WHO um, for like almost 20 years at this point. But many, many people are still not going for the AR and the UL as the critical levels. So the limitations of the available reference values um, shockingly, I can say it in this audience, WHO, FAO has no ARs or ULs except for B12 and folate because they just were honest and just took them from the National Academy report. IOM and EFSA have no ARs for sick nutrients. And instead, they couldn't set them, they thought, based on the lack of evidence, and so they proposed adequate intakes which are the intake defined as the intakes um, that uh, seem to be adequate in healthy, well-nourished populations. Many of the values in both reports for young children and infants are extrapolated up from the infant AI set on the basis of, of breast milk composition, which is very wrong, much of the data there or downwards from the adult AR or AI. So you get big jumps around, say, here's a calcium example. The AI is 260 milligrams up to one year, and then at one year, the EAR changes to 500. How do you deal with that when you're formulating foods and recommendations? It's impossible. And finally, the true requirements are variable, and estimates of bioavailability and intakes are always uncertain. By the time you've cooked your food, you don't have what was in there anyway, you thought was in there anyway. So again, I'm just emphasizing that there, there just really isn't a lot of value in um, spending millions on perfecting these by a few milligrams per nutrient. So this is the um, um, uh, IOM figure, or actually this is the figure that we used in our paper um, that we just published. So on the left there, what we're proposing is harmonized ARs and harmonized ULs 
that can be applied globally or modified within countries if people would like. So um, this is the average nutrient requirement. They're called different things by different agencies, um, but we're calling it the harmonized average requirement. Here is the UL, which we're calling the harmonized upper level. And then here is what is often called the RDA or the PRI by EFSA, RNA by WHO. And that, those values are two standard deviations higher than the average requirements to meet 95% or so of the population. Of course, we don't know what the standard de deviation really is. And so there's another huge error that you have to realize is existing. Okay. So how did we develop these HARs? We used EFSA for most of them because they were set most recently. The IOM values were set um, some uh, old, an older time, so they had fewer um, uh, papers to support them, and, uh, but we did use the newer IOM values for vitamin D and calcium because these were revised with systematic reviews in 2011. So that sounds straightforward. EFSA did also do some systematic reviews on some nutrients, um, not very many, but there are some. The problem is that EFSA has ARs for only seven vitamins and three minerals. IOM has ARs for 10 vitamins, and nine minerals, so we use the IOM values if there weren't any EFSA values. And the, these are the uh, nutrients that had uh, no EFSA values. And then if there were large differences between the EFSA and IOM values, um, we discussed why we chose certain, um, why we chose one value over the other. And this is just an example of a table in the paper. Um, showing the source of values that we used for our HARs for vitamins and minerals. So this is the decision that we made which one to use. These are the functional outcomes that were used in each case by these authoritative bodies. And there's discussion in the text about the, the backing for our decisions. Um, so here is a, the set of harmonized ARs for protein and vitamins here, and then there's another table for minerals. You will notice that some of these are in um, italics across the top, his pantothenic acid, biotin, and choline. And those are because we actually, when they were missing ARs, we took the um, RDA level and subtracted two standard deviations to get back to an AR. This is not good practice. It's not wonderful at all, but it's a heck of a lot better than having no value at all. So that's how we developed um, some additional ARs. So we have ARs for all of the nutrients. So if AR was no AR, AR is available, we estimated it from the AI because six nutrients have no AR in either data set calculated the HAR as AI over 1.25 to, to reduce it by those coefficients of variation, which we don't know truly what they are anyway. It probably overestimates requirement. It is better than using nothing and certainly better than using the AI or the RDA for estimating the prevalence of inadequate intakes. We italicized it in the tables to show our lower, our lower level of certainty. Um, another issue is that the AIs are based on usual intakes of well-fed populations, so they might even be higher um, than, um, uh, than they are in lower income countries and, again, lead to overestimation of requirements. Uh, we didn't do this for very young infants except for iron, zinc, and protein. I uh, don't have time to go into the reasons for that now. So here are our average, average requirements that were calculated. And so um, th it shows again that what we have done is say, this is what the IOM value was, the EFSA value was, and then 
how we made the decision um, about uh, choosing a specific value. Um, we do have bioavailability corrections for iron and zinc. Um, here are the ones for iron, which are um, uh, close to what the uh, WHO suggests. Um, so the percent bioavailability from a high absorption uh, uh, diet versus a low uh, absorption diet will be different. And here we have value, suggested values uh, for what those should be. And the same for zinc. Um, this is based on the International Zinc Consultative Group. And there's more work going on in these areas, but here is a, a good start for suggestions. Finally, proposed upper levels. Um, the EFSA values are surprisingly old, 2000 to 2005, and they're for eight minerals and six vitamins. The IOM values um, range of different dates, 97 to 2011, but much better explained in terms of why the upper levels were, um, were um, set. FAO, WHO have some, for example, vitamin A in the perinatal period, and we definitely took account of that. And there are many reasons why these HULs are different. They're the noisiest data set of all. Um, different adverse effects, different supplements, and so on, but we tried to explain our decisions very carefully. And here again, you have a table with uh, the reasons for our decision and the adverse effects uh, that we accepted from these other authorities. So in summary, we have now a set of 25 AR, nutrients with ARs, and 19 for ULs. The gaps are filled in for better or worse. These were based on extensive reviews in the US, Canada, and Europe, and on the expenditure of millions of dollars already to get this far. We didn't just make them up. So this provides, we believe, a core set of very useful values to estimate the prevalence of inadequate and excess intakes of specific nutrients, intake gaps that need filling through programs, risk of excess intake through fortification, which is not monitored nearly closely enough, or supplementation, or in many cases both now, and then differences in intake adequacy across countries and regions, which should influence global policy. An important point, countries, regions, whatever, may decide to set their dietary guidelines, right, completely different from nutrient intake recommendations, based on their own target median intake. In other words, the goal is to define what percent of the population you think um, should meet the AR in your case. If it's, if it's um, lower, then your dietary guidelines are going to have to be higher, more food expenditures. If it's lower, um, then the dietary guidelines will be simpler, less expensive. You certainly don't want to set your dietary guidelines based on the RDA. The RDA, if you set, if you set it on the RDA, it will mean that you're supplying enough of each nutrient for everybody. And so you've got 97.5% of the population consuming more than they actually require. Okay, big important point. Countries should also adjust the adjust bioavailability of iron, zinc, and possibly other nutrients. So this provides, we feel, a basis to assist countries and agencies to adopt, modify, revise um, uh, as they would like, and not have to do an expensive, more limited process. I think we have, in Sue's words, kind of sorted out the existing information as it is now, and um, condensed that into a summary, which of course will need ongoing critique and updates. So discussion questions, 
Uh, I agree with everybody, it needs an international body to review, update, and keep a library of systematic reviews, monitor, and evaluate applications. I don't think each country, and possibly each region, could do that. It needs to be an international body. Who would this be? Um, WHO, FAO, IUNS, uh, people have suggested ILSI, I don't know. I think it needs a new body altogether, in my opinion. It needs funding, lots of funding, from governments, industry, agencies, whatever. But think of the money that would be saved from, by all the countries right now investing all the time and money they do in developing their own recommendations. I don't think starting from scratch in each case, or even building perhaps on older values, is very wise. What are the constraints to using these values? I'm sure a number of you are sitting here quite horrified at the prospect of um, maybe taking these home and saying, why don't we use these? We all have worked on committees with local um, professionals who have their own stake, let's say, in setting these recommendations, and it's not easy. Um, to change their mind or have them appreciate the larger picture. And so what steps next to implement um, global recommendations? I hope I've shown you that I think it's feasible and um, perhaps we don't need to panic uh, about the overwhelming uh, number of steps you'd have to take if you were doing this from scratch. Thank you. <laughs>